Okay, our last session already here. It's gone so quickly. It's been a lot of fun, at least from my perspective, and uh, uh, a lot of good memories here. We'll have a few more memories created uh, uh, today just to fly through what we're going to be doing in the next couple of hours. Talk about the uh, Ira Glass uh, interview. A and then um, Clay Masters will be joining us, hopefully. There might be a little bit of suspense on whether he joins us or not, but we're working on the Skype, um, the technology to have uh, Clay Masters. How many of you listen to Clay Masters on Morning Edition? Okay, a lot of Clay Masters fans. He'll be happy to, to, to know that. And uh, after that, we'll take a break, and then we're going to talk about, oh yeah, we're going to talk about your interviews uh, that you had as homework to interview um, a pivotal experience of so someone about a pivotal experience in their life. And uh, just as a show of hands, so I know how much time to gauge for this, how many have something to share about their experience that I can come to? Half dozen to a dozen. Okay, that gives me an idea. Thank you. Uh, then as promised, <laughs> sorry, what was the comment? It is, it is. Um, uh, and then as promised last week, AMA, who remembers what AMA is? Ask me anything. Ask me anything? This is, so you've got a few minutes to think about your deepest, darkest questions that will be very tough for me to answer about interviewing. We're going to put some <laughs> parameters on that. See, you thought I wasn't going to put that little, on, little end on there. Um, you've got your evaluations. We'll give you a little bit of time for your evaluations uh, at the end of the program. I'm glad that um, our governor is not evaluating me. I'll let you listen to why here in a little bit. Hopefully we'll have a little, a little chance to hear that. She um, was a funny end to an interview that I did with her last uh, week. Then perhaps, hopefully, when we, when we finish up, I'll finish up with one of the strangest interviews you'll ever see, James Brown. Any James Brown fans out there? Of course. How can you not be a fan of the Godfather of Soul, right? Okay, so that's the look forward. You will see James Brown as you've never seen him before, live in an interview. One of the favorite interviews of when I teach this uh, to uh, undergraduates at the uh, uh, journalism school. Let's talk about that Ira Glass discussion. This was uh, part of the Turnaround podcast. I got the name right this time. Not roundabout, the Turnaround podcast. Um, before I say anything, tell me what jumped out. Did you make some notes? Uh, what, what did you gain as an insight from that interview of uh, Ira Glass uh, that, uh, that you didn't know or were perhaps a little bit surprised by? Sherry. Yes. So two things jumped out at me. One was he wasn't afraid to disagree with his interviewer. Uh, the interviewer would say, well, don't you think? And he'd say, well, no, I don't think. <laughs> and I thought that was good. And then the other thing was, he, Ira Glass talked about a moment, a special moment in the interview, and that's what he kind of strived for. And I thought that was an interesting thing because I think that's a good thing to strive for. Right, and do you do you remember what he compared in, in in talking about that moment? What he compared it with, which was remarkable, which I would not compare it with in, in my interviews. And this gets to the point of different goals. Are, you, you got a blank there, okay? Because I think we on the other side of the room, we have an answer to that question. Get some work out here. This was really shocking. He fell in love with his interviewee. He said, said it was like a first date, right? Yeah, that uh, amazing. I mean, how how intense would that be? So here we get at a point, and this is why I wanted to have you listen to this, that different interviews have different goals. Ira Glass has a completely different goal for what he's doing than, for instance, what I do on a daily basis, though my goals can change uh, from show to show, from interview to interview. Uh, he, he says, you know, uh, he was wanting to have a special moment and really working hard for it. And uh, he, he, he said, that it was like a first date, um, all of a sudden being very intimate with a stranger. Okay, so that's really interesting. So that's what Ira Glass is, is, is about, and that's what his team is about, too. 
And remember we talked, was it last week, I was talking about how much distillation is going on with a This American Life. You can have hours and hours and hours of recording interviews that turn into maybe 20 minutes, or as he pointed out in that interview, turn into nothing, are simply killed and left on some computer, <clears throat> some computer drive somewhere, never to be heard by his audience. So that's, uh, that's interesting. What else jumped out at you about, about this Ira Glass? Let me see, best way to get back to uh, Carolyn, back right over your shoulder. Um, I love the fact that he said he gets nervous before an interview, and when the interviewer challenged him, he said no one is famous to themselves. To me, that said that he really gets into the role, and it's not about Ira, it's about this person and their story. Great point, yeah. And, and you know, that is because what Ira's doing or what any interview is doing that is being consumed, you know, as I do or Ira does with uh, all the listeners he has, it's, it's part performance, right? And, and we had a newspaper reporter in here point this out, I think after class last time, that only realizing now, hey, you know, when I was a newspaper reporter, I was not, you know, I was interviewing a city councilor or something like this. When I was doing the interview, that was to, to harvest quotes, to get uh, position statements or something like that. And then when you're doing what Ira Glass is doing or my job, the question is part of a performance, right? Uh, so so that, that's, that gets to the point that, that, that you were talking about there too. What else in this interview? Okay. Let's see, Joan. I thought that Ira Glass was quite a perfectionist because he said at one time that he interviewed someone and nothing was magical for him, and they did it again the next day, I think, or maybe the next week. That, who remembers? I think that that was with a colleague of his, or was it, he, he was interviewing someone and he said the magic was not there. So there we go back to the, the first date, you know? You go on your first date and you sit at the table at the diner or the restaurant and hmm, what do you do? Because there's nothing, there's nothing really clicking there. Uh, yeah, so being willing to, well, to do everything you can to set it up to have something happen with the chemistry, to do your preparation. Uh, but if nothing happens in that case, hmm, okay, we have to let it go. I think the best analogy to, uh, you know, interviewing especially in a live circumstance, what I do is um, all the work that comes before is like you've invited people to a dinner party. And you say, okay, I think um, these, this set of people will work well together. And you've all put together these parties. Say, no, don't get those two together. We will have a horrible evening. Do not do that. But this mix of six, eight people coming over for the, that's going to be good. Okay, so you do that. You invite your guests, you plan it out, and then you get in your kitchen, you cut up your vegetables, you make your salad, you do everything. The doorbell rings. The doorbell ringing is the start of the live show. You've done your best planning, but you really don't know what's going to happen. You as the host can steer it to where you'd like it to go, but things can go strangely wonderful or a little bit off the rails in a certain way that um, you might not expect or might not like. Um, I think this is probably a good time to play uh, a little bit of my interview last week with uh, Kim Reynolds because something happened in this interview that, you know, and, and Ira talked about this in his interview there. I think he called them professional speakers. People who have trained, have been in the limelight, in public policy for a long time so that they're well trained to answer questions and remember we talked about pivoting to make it seem like they're answering questions they don't want to answer to get onto the topics they do want to talk about. Um, so these are what I would prefer uh, called professional talkers here. Now they're very good professional talkers and there's some that you know um, are, are learning learning the ropes. Let's, let's listen to a little bit of our, our new governor um, this is last, what day was it? Was it Tuesday? I don't remember. It all kind of, 
blends one into the next for me. Um, had her on live for the first half of the show. I'm going to jump to a point right at the end. How many? Did anybody listen to this interview? Did anybody hear the, the last part of it? Okay, you're not sure. Well, we'll get to the last. A lot of, you know, policy going here. And uh, there are different types of the, uh, parts of an interview. And typically, you save your most sensitive questions for the end. Because if you're in a live situation and um, you, you ask a question that that person really does not want to talk about, and you have to be a little bit aggressive in trying to get an answer out of them, you risk spoiling the atmosphere, spoiling that relationship. And then what do you do for the rest of the time here? Right? Okay. So you, you generally, you know, it's called the bomb. <laughs> you you uh, let the bomb go at the end. This is not, it's not the bomb, but it's the, the thing that's closest to it at the end. Now, uh, a, a couple weeks ago, uh, Governor Reynolds was at, I think, her first GOP fundraiser, and she made some comments that, that got some press attention. Who remembers what the comment was? The, the phrase, yeah, go, oh, just a minute. Let me get over there. I forgot I have a microphone I need to use. All right. There we go. Connie. I think it was the one on, um, she stated at the, at the fundraiser that Democrats were unhinged. Liberals are unhinged. Yeah, li liberals. Yes, yes. <laughs> Liberals unhinged. That was the thing that unhinged people <laughs> who thought this. Okay, so, so anyway, so that's my jumping off point. I actually had a producer pull this tape from the actual fundraiser. So we're going along, and we've had about 15 minutes, uh, just to, to set this in, so from my perspective, about 15 minutes of policy. We've gotten through a lot of good things. Everything has been good, you know, um, answer and answers and follow-ups and so forth. And now this, this is coming. And I'm really curious about how she would answer that. Uh, would she just kind of say, oh, it was off the cuff. Um, I said it, but you know, that's what happens when you're at a GOP fundraiser or a Democratic fundraiser. You say things you might not mean or overgeneralize. Liberals are unhinged to, to please the crowd. So we were talking, you know, how is she going to deal with this? This is how she dealt with it. So what I want you to do when we, I'll, I'll, I'll have to start it and then kind of find my point here uh, where I'd like you to, to listen. I'm looking at, I made the, the point. I want to make sure, we, oh yeah, we've got plenty of time for 1930 in. Okay, so when we're listening to this, keep in mind, um, fairly, I can stand the criticism, were my questions and follow-ups fair? Uh, what does her reaction to this tell you? And thirdly, if you were her advisor and she wanted authentic, real advice from you and you were sitting in the next room after this happened, she's on the phone here, what feedback would you give the governor? Those three things, okay? Um, another very important thing that may, that may not be evident completely is uh, because, you know, the, the listener doesn't necessarily know how, how this works. We have a system that at 20, on, on my show, it happens to be the clock cuts me off at 2930. So you will be hearing us come right up to that. I am looking at this clock. I thought I had given her sufficient time, about two minutes to answer this question. But as you hear at the beginning, she spins out this anecdote that has me wondering if she actually heard the question at first. <laughs> Uh, but it turns out, you know, she did it for a reason. But we're bumping up against a hard stop. It's a stop that my engineer can't do anything about. I can't do anything about. Our automation, our computers will just go ka-chunk, and it's done, okay? That you do not want to have happen. So that's why you hear at the end of this <laughs> a little bit of background of what I'm thinking, live situation, here we go. Okay, enough talk. I've set the scene Ben enough. Kiefer, my guest this hour, for the first time as governor, Kim Reynolds Let me jump is with us joining you. <laughs> the essence of this lady session. And we spent uh, jobs attributed to depressed. Let's start right here. We're at 19. It'll take about 30 seconds before I change to this other topic. I'll let Eric adjust the levels if he needs to. The importance of 
um, just modernizing and not not pulling out. And just and, and how I've, I've been as I travel the state, there's been a lot of um, I think anxiety and angst, and I've noticed that tick up a little bit in the last three weeks. And I, I think we need a little more volume in the room if we could, we need Eric. To bring some stability to the markets, and we need to continue I'll to look for not only maintaining our existing market share, but look for new opportunities as well. It's why we lead a trade mission every year. So I reiterated my concerns to Vice President Pence, um, as well as uh, U.S. Trade, Rep, uh, Rep, trade Representative, I think, Ambassador Lighthizer uh, as well. And the congressional delegation is there, too. So uh, mm-hmm. we're all working very, very closely with, with that, uh, all members of our delegation. We have just a couple minutes left, uh, Governor. I have to ask you about this. We had so many questions on our Facebook page. Also, I see that your words uh, from a few days ago even inspired a ray gun T-shirt. I don't know if you've seen the T-shirt, but uh, I think you know what I'm referring to. At a recent GOP fundraiser, uh, you said this. As, as we all know, as we travel the state, the liberals are unhinged, and uh, they are out for us. And we need to double down and do all we can. And if you keep fighting, I'll keep fighting. Let's keep this united team together because, my gosh, we want to build on the successes that we've seen this last legislative session. And we want to keep Iowa moving forward. We don't want them to come in and reverse the good work that we've done. Okay, that was at the, the Harvest Festival in Des Moines. Yeah. What, is you, what, yeah. Did you mean, what did you mean by unhinged? It has unhinged to some of our listeners, and I'm sure it's, it's gotten back to you to use that word on well, what is uh, uh, a lot of uh, mm-hmm. Iowans? Okay, well, I'll give you just I'll give you one example. So, you know, I'm the governor of all Iowans, and even you know, even people that disagree with me. So, that statement is probably um, it was a broad statement, and it's about probably a very narrow group of individuals. But I, I want to give you an example. So, um, and as my social media account, I, I'm a grandmother of nine. I have nine grandchildren. And uh, I have a personal account uh, as well as the official account. And, you know, my family is very important to me. I, um, you, know, it, I, you know, I make time for them and have, because they're a big part of uh, who I am and, and what I do. And I was at my grandson's uh, soccer game. And this is a six-year-old and an eight-year-old playing soccer. And as a grandma, I posted a, a picture of the two of them on my private account. Um, you know, saying what a fun day it was to watch the two of them playing soccer. And the comments that were put on that post mm-hmm. were unbelievable. And right, right, right. right. But, the, well, no, no, no. I'm the governor, and I'm tough, and I know what I yep. signed up for, but my family did not. And basically, I'm poisoning the water, and I hope it kills your grandmother and I, for your, your children. Right, right. And, and that, I'm being that, that, kind. That, and so that is over the top. I, that is exactly. I and co- that is I mean, one small example. These children. But you said liberals in the state are unhinged. You cast that aspersion on all liberals in the state. I guess that's the gripe. Well, here you go. Here, I'm giving you an example, and that is one example. One small example. Now, I'm Come after me. That's fine. But the discourse in this country is got to stop. We need to be able to. Right. But you, you use the word talk. unhinged. Does that help the discourse when you use well, a, a partisan well, I'm sorry, unhinged? When they're attacking, when they're attacking my, my grandchildren, I, uh, that to me is over the top. Mm-hmm. I had my daughter call and say, you know, what? Did you know this person? Take that down, Mom. This is ridiculous. Mm-hmm. I, under- and, I you understand. Know, what do you think? Yeah. Well, that, do, you, do you think that's unhinged? Do you think that's over the Well, top? that particular over comment over is completely uncalled for. We've run out of time. We want to thank you so much, Governor Reynolds, for joining us. Well, it is over the top. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. When we come back... That is over the top. That, that is over the top. Thank you for the final words there, too. Well... You know, I wish there would have been more time there because I felt bad about having her rush. But, you know, there, I looked at the time when we started. We had a, when I asked the question, we had two minutes for an answer. Now this, of course, you know, at that first part, eventually you get the point that she's making. But the first minute I looked through the window at my producer, I'm like, where, you know, where is this going? All of a sudden we're at a, a soccer game for her kids. And, okay, someone posts something on Facebook that is... And believe me, I know what it's like to have uh, nasty comments directed at you. If you're in a public figure in any way, uh, that will happen, you know. Um, and so, uh, yeah, th- this happened. Uh, so the three questions. Uh, the first one I'm forgetting at the moment. What, what, okay, were, were my questions and follow-ups fair? Huh? You think, Mary? 
Yeah, I do think so. Okay. But I want to say something about the program because I realized I did listen to it and I almost turned it off. If you hadn't been doing it, I would have turned it off because it had a weird <laughs> echo. I could hardly understand what, what she said. You were fine as always. Right. We're dependent on, you know, no. what, 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 yeah, yeah. We're dependent on, on what phone the governor in this case is on. Cell phone, you know, the worst case scenario for us was we, our producers try to avoid a cell phone and you're moving around or your cell phone and you're driving because then you're going from, it's, it's, it's horrible. So we have had to deal with this over the years as people have been dropping landlines and picking up cell phones is, is fewer and fewer landlines are out there. So we have less opportunity to use them. I don't know what kind of phone she was. When you get an interview with the governor and, and our producers had been going after this for a long time, you don't say, oh, well, yeah, sure, but, but it has to be a cell phone. That's not a condition you put on the governor. That's a condition you put on other people and say, you've got to get to a landline or to one of our studios when we do that. Okay, uh, any other comments on, on, and I pointed out the time issue. That's my one regret here is, is the time issue. I wish there had been a little bit more. I hate to have people feel like they're cut short. And so that is a little bit of an ouch uh, for me. Uh, what does the reaction, her reaction to the question tell you? <laughs> we'll go back to Cindy. I thought she was quite defensive. Others think that, other, yeah, let's go over here to you too, John. I think she was trying to come up with a personalized excuse to avoid answering the question. And so she pivoted that way. Carolyn seems to agree back there. So this, yeah, this is exactly what I wanted to get at. So what we're doing here in the political world is to, to kind of evoke empathy and tell a story. Who cannot sympathize with someone who gets, who has their grandchildren attacked on social media. So actually a pretty good strategy here um, to, but then you've got the leap from a few people on social media attacked a picture of my grandkids to, you've still got a wide gap between that and liberals are unhinged. I hope you agree, regardless of your political persuasion. That's, that's a tall order, isn't it, uh, Catherine, or not? Was, was there any reaction to this in the newspaper? Uh, not that I saw, but there may have been. I don't know, did anybody? Is that unusual? That, that what? That the newsman wouldn't pick up on that interview and talk about it later? Okay. Well, it, I, I don't know what is newsworthy in there. Um, This is a different kind of comment, but I have rarely heard you, uh, with a guest, kind of fighting for the mic. I have, so you, yeah, I've rarely heard that from you. And I, I'm, not, I'm not saying it was wrong of you at all, but I, I so obviously you were a little frustrated. Well, and, and the clock, the sand is running out of the hourglass there. And I'm like, she's going to get halfway through this anecdote that makes no sense <laughs> unless you hear the end of it. I want her to finish it up. And then finally I grasp what she's doing and I say, okay, I know where she's going with this. You're attacked on social media. That's why you made this comment. So I had to kind of try to fast forward her through this. Um, and things like okay, uh, before we join, uh, Clay is going to be coming up here in a minute. Uh, you're her advisor. What do you, what do you say? It's just the two of you in the room, and you, uh, she, she has her, she has complete confidence in you, and you're not a yes woman or a yes man. What do you tell her about kind of forward looking about this? Say, she says so, Sherry or Cindy. What kind of feedback do you have for that? How, how can I improve in the future when something like that happens? Okay, we'll go back. We're going to go back to Carolyn here because I didn't get it back to you. I, I would tell her that she was very unprofessional in how she answered your question. It, it felt to me as if she had totally lost control. I keep thinking back to your interview of Grassley in the pivot. He was in control of that answer and he had a purpose. I think she was just totally unhinged and I would really call her on it. I'm sorry, I couldn't resist. <laughs> but unprofessional is the best word I can come up with for her response. She didn't have 
control of what she would want to accomplish with talking with you. People agree with that a little bit? So, so maybe you will see, you know, in, in other cases, and I've interviewed all of our members of Congress, past members of Congress, presidential candidates, and, and so forth. And this is, this is where, you know, maybe your experience shows through that uh, the, the idea, and this is where media training, I'm sure Diane Bystrom, we had a couple weeks ago here, talks about this, uh, regardless of what happens, um, keep it civil and uh, you know, to the point, if you're going to pivot, pivot. But here is, here is a really emo an emotional reaction. Okay, right on cue, Clay Masters. Oh man, you are so much on time, Clay. Are you there, Clay? Uh oh, he's. I. He's your your picture is frozen. Are, can can you hear me? I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yeah. Why the serious face? This is a this is an okay day for you, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, I'm going to turn around. You're not seeing anything. That's why. You're not seeing my face. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to turn this around. You get to see my class here. Okay, here we go. Where are you, in some kind of fishing lodge somewhere? <laughs> Me? No, I'm in my house. Okay. Your house looks like, your house looks like a fishing lodge. Uh, there we go. <laughs> lots, lots of fish. Okay, I'm going to let... So can you see, see that class in the background? We've been together for four yep. weeks now. This is, you are, you are the, the final event, Clay Masters. Can you hear me all right? Okay. You can hear me? There's I can. You're breaking up a little bit. Okay, there's a slight delay here. I guess we'll just have to work with it here. But uh, before, as class started about a half an hour ago, uh, I said, how many Clay Masters, how many listen to Clay Masters out there? Every freaking hand went up. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> Sorry to let down. <laughs> okay. So let's talk a little bit. We want to have a little time for, first of all, Clay, thanks for making time. Because yeah, uh, what, what people realize if they think about it, uh, but if not, you know, you, you get up at what time in order to morning edition? Uh, quarter till four. I get up at 3.45 every morning. Okay. I, I hear the grumbles. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so thank you for extending your day and, and working us in here, because I know you're busy not only with that. You are not only Iowa Public Radio's morning edition host, but also lead political reporter uh, and also uh, part of the team that was uh, uh, covered the, who covered for NPR the 2016 presidential election. We want to talk about that a little bit. So, Clay, just a little background. We've had several perspectives during this class. Uh, Emily Woodbury, our colleague, uh, the producer's perspective on interviewing, uh, um, talked with a media trainer, you know, Diane Bystrom there, uh, about how she and her programs um, sort of train uh, up and coming would be uh, up and coming uh, public figures. Uh, we had the mother last week of a uh, a young woman who was murdered. Talk about the the media circus that can surround a, a tragic event like that. So we're looking to you for uh, your take on your individual perspective on interviewing. Can you just start off by by giving us sort of a, a Clay's basic steps for preparing for an interview? Uh, yeah, um, you broke up a little bit there, but you said the, just the, the basic steps yeah, for interviewing. Yeah, sort of, sort so of the, ba the basic steps of, of, um, uh, of you know, uh, let's say a political interview, since that's what, what you, uh, a main focus of yours. Well, how, how do you approach a political interview, or, or what, uh, um, what, what difference does it make who you're interviewing and, and what you're going after? Yeah, so, I mean, I never feel like I'm not uh, preparing for an interview, um, I'm naturally a curious person. I spend a lot of time uh, every morning listening to Morning Edition, uh, paying attention to state news. In a way, by remaining curious and interested in various topics going on in the state and on the national front, uh, you just kind of stay engaged. And so that's one thing. Um, I am just always paying attention to what's going on uh, as far as what's in the headlines, what's in the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Cedar Rapids Gazette, the Des Moines Register, uh, continuing to uh, just 
keep an eye on what's going on and in, in, around the country and by listening to NPR. I listen to it all the time when I'm not on. Um, you know, I'm also finding uh, ways to prep just by keeping an eye on uh, what various uh, social media platforms are, are saying about different topics, uh, primarily trusted journalists or uh, various newsmakers. Just so I, I really feel like I'm never not paying attention to to what's going on in the news. Uh, when I'm preparing for an actual uh, interview, there are two kinds of um, stories that or two different kinds of interviews that I'm doing. Number one is uh, what we call all the, the pieces uh, in the business that's referring to, if you listen to public radio, you're familiar with the four-minute segment or the five-minute segment, which is um, a, a reported piece. So it's a num number of interviews. Um, I'm thinking back to, I had a story air, I guess it was uh, late last week, um, on water quality concerns uh, after the Des Moines Water Works lawsuit. I think I did, I, I put in... Um, quite a few hours on that, traveled a little bit for it, multiple, multiple interviews. I think I did six or seven interviews and about four of those people, five of those people made it into it. You know, these were long interviews that I did, um, but not everything makes the cut. Of course, when I'm talking with, uh, various sources that I'm going to be using for a piece, I tell them that, you know, not everything that, uh, you tell me is going to make it into uh, the story, and but it but it definitely helps shape the reporting process. So you know, the more you tell me, the better. The other kind of interview that I do, and it's not as frequent as the pieces that I do, um, are for what we call two ways, basically interviews. I mean, Ben does these every day on River to River when he's interviewing uh, newsmakers or journalists, and uh, those I approach a little bit differently because. More of uh, my uh, questions are going to be in that I'm thinking about timing. And so the, the pieces, the interviews that I do for pieces, always feel a little bit more relaxed because, uh, you know, if, if you need to start something up again, you're not butted up against time. So, you know, uh, most interviews I spend just a little bit of time prepping for. Um, when I'm going out to do a piece because I know what the scope of the story is. I kind of know what I need from the different sources. Um, and those interviews help inform me the kind of questions that I need to, to ask. And so it also, it just takes being an active listener when you're actually there doing the interview. Right. Uh, we, we've been talking a little bit before about evasive, evasive interview partners, people who pivot away from answering a question or uh, do not answer a question flat out. Now, it's interesting because you have the, the experience of having, you know, you're collecting tape, looking for, uh, you know, bites, sound bites for a feature, but you're also doing interviews for morning edition or whatever, where, as you say, it's, it's more or less a two-way where you're having a conversation. Now, it's interesting because you have these two experiences. Is there a difference then in those two situations in how far you will press someone when they're not answering the question, when they're giving you, and these are professional, let's just call them professional talkers, typically right. po politicians there. Do you operate differently in one, um, one, one condition than the other? Well, I think that um with any kind of interview you're doing, if they're not going to answer your question, there's only, only so many times you can chase them around the tree. Um, and a lot of times the way that the question is not answered and continuously not answered says a lot about the stance that that person is taking. Um, I can remember uh, 2015 when the caucuses were in full swing interviewing Wisconsin Governor Scott Walker. And I uh, asked him, this was for a two-way, so this was for an interview. We were interviewing all the candidates that, were, that we could get our hands on to interview. Um, I remember there was a lot of question about him uh, flip-flopping on various issues. And I, I, I saw an opportunity to you know, maybe make him uh, you know, more relatable or, or, or see what he would have to say to the question of, has there ever been something where you have changed your mind, where you were adamantly, you know, uh, opposed to something and changed your mind. And he said to me, no, I can't think of one. And I said, you, you, you can't think of one time that uh, you have 
changed your mind about something because that, that you know, I was kind of giving him an opportunity to, to show a little, you know, of his personal side. And he said, nope, in my 40 some years, you know, I, I, I've never made one uh, decision that I've changed my mind on. And so, I mean, like, he didn't really answer my question, but you kind of got you, you kind of got a feel for his character by the way he was avoiding the question. Um, so a, a lot of times um, there's not if, if somebody's not going to answer your question, there's you run the risk of burning that source uh, in the future. You know, ask the question uh, in two ways. The nice thing about that is that the the audience can hear the the way that you form the question. Uh, you follow up with another question. If they're still not answering it, you, you, you kind of just have to move on a lot of times. Mm -hmm. um, we had just listened before. You, you came online with us here, the interview that I did last week with Governor Reynolds, and I don't know. Oh, yeah. But I think you were, you were answering some Twitter. Uh, it, it had been talked about, not just because of my interview, but this unhinged comment got quite a bit of play. Uh, Ray Gunn made a T-shirt out of it, and, and it was it was talked about quite a bit. So uh, that th we were just discussing, you know, things that happen as a surprise. You can plan for an interview. I, I said it was sort of like having a in a live situation, having a dinner party. You can invite the friends you think the chemistry will work with. You can chop all your vegetables, get all your meal ready, and then the doorbell rings and they come, and you can still have unexpected things happen. This was a case in point. Yeah, and I think, too, with that interview, uh, one of the issues um, that you run the risk of, you know, with a phone interview like that was on River to River was that, you know, once the once the interview was done, she was she was out of time. She was off the off the line. Um, so sometimes you're in a personal setting uh, where you're one on one, you can maybe engage a little after. And so, I mean, that that's something, too, that, you know by no fault of the way that the interview was done. It's just yeah. the, the way that the, the, the interview got planned. Um, so, yeah, you, you never kind of know how they're going to respond to something. And, and another thing that I haven't talked about, too, is uh, working sources. And, you know, I regularly meet with, uh, especially during election cycles, uh, with campaign communications director, with party directors, uh, getting coffee with them, talking with them so they know who I am. Uh, I get uh, pushed back a lot, um, but if you've already engaged in a, if you already have a rapport with someone, then they're they're much more likely to keep wanting to talk to you if you, you know, might push them in a, in a direction they weren't expecting. Mm -hmm. Talk a little bit about about that because I know what one of the things the the hard work that you do that isn't uh, appreciated enough or or seen or realized by listeners is working for weeks, months to get an interview. Uh, maybe you're going to talk about the 2016 yeah. campaign and uh, talk a little bit more about that because, you know, you can, if I remember last year at a certain point, there were a few hours or a day or so when you thought Donald Trump was going to be someone for you to, to, to interview and, and it, it didn't pan out. No, it didn't. So um, that was, uh, so... We had said that during the 2015 cycle, or I guess it was 2016, but we're in Iowa, right? So uh, yeah. it was two years. But throughout 2015, I mean, the, the now president's campaign uh, was didn't really have much of a presence in the state. He would parachute in. It was really hard to find people that were connected with him. Um, and then when he, when, when he became the nominee, uh, suddenly the Republican National Committee— uh, uh, started sending their troops to Iowa, and I had worked with the RNC uh, when you know for a national campaign when uh, Governor Romney was running for president, and there was you know going back through some of my sources, connecting with the local RNC person that was here, uh, talking with her. Uh, we had set up an opportunity, and she had to work for quite a while to give me the opportunity to interview uh, Donald Trump. And that was one of those things where it was the day of the interview, uh, and it was going to be either before or I think it was before a rally that was in a was in a suburb of Des Moines. Um, and I was texting up until the last five minutes up to it to see if it was actually going to happen. And then they last minute told me, 
uh, uh, sorry, we've decided that this interview or this venue where this rally is happening isn't conducive to the kind of one-on-one -on -one interview you would want, which, believe it or not, I don't know, but uh, so that was a, a, an issue where I didn't have the opportunity, you know, I had the opportunity, was under the uh, impression that it was going to happen, but then it didn't. Uh, they had said that, you know, there would be an opportunity maybe later in the campaign to do that, but it didn't pan out. Mm -hmm. so, the one so, that got away. Yeah. So, so the, 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 if you kind of equate this with fishing, putting your line in the, in the water and sometimes pulling out one and sometimes not, um, uh, you get um, some insights as to the campaign's perspective, how they, mm -hmm. how they view you. And so you want to make yourself appealing to them. Um, I don't know if you can, you can talk about how, you, how they see you. You must have some, some insights about how they see you because you're wanting to appeal to them and make yourself a, an appealing person to say yes to, right? Yeah, I mean, it's, it also has a lot to do with the fact that Iowa Public Radio is a respected organization within the state of Iowa, mm -hmm. that we're in the top uh, tiers of all the market broadcast news. Um, that speaks to them. And, you know, it, it's a matter of just having people kind of vouch for you. Uh, and it's it's the longer you're in the state, a lot of the players are the same or their uh, colleagues or acquaintances with new campaign directors or communication directors that have parachuted in for the next cycle. So, yeah, I mean, it's just showing them that I'm a decent person, I guess. <laughs> Let's say you, you have an intern there and th they want to know some key things about, about interviewing. What, what are you going to most communicate to a person about a political interview? Maybe some of the things you've already mentioned, but what do you really want to drive home to someone who aspires to do what you do? Uh, um, I think the, the, that's the hardest thing to get used to is just to... Uh, relax but still be on top of your game it that might come a little more naturally uh when you're recording for a story that's not going to be you know a two-way like we've said that the interviews uh that you hear uh when when you're interviewing the, the, the person one-on-one -on -one. uh but trying to provide a setting that makes it just feel like that you are in a, in a, in a relaxing atmosphere that you can talk with me, uh, that I'm not going to tear you apart, but at the same time being ready for those follow-up questions. I mean, it's, it's a matter of asking open-ended questions, uh, what, how, why, and being, cause that's going to get, you know, the more thought out response, but being ready to ask the closed, uh, in the closed ended questions of, you know, where, you know, are you going to vote for the bill? I mean, it, it's a matter of of, of, a, of just being up on your game while still, you know, providing the sense that you can talk to me. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so I don't. It, it takes time. It takes uh, just talking to people, really. I mean, and, and always ready for for it to go in an opposite direction. Now, you do different types. Uh, back to sort of the feature, uh, the yeah. feature scenario for interviewing, where you're really looking for, we call them sound bites um, there too. Um, you know, people who don't know, do not work in our business may not know how you acquire sort of antenna for a sound bite. And we know from working in it, they kind of uh, jump out at you in, in, in certain situations. Uh, what are your insights in, in this, you know, it's different from situation to situation on, uh, on how you can explain to someone who, who doesn't do this every day how you recognize a, a, a news, a newsworthy cut. Yeah, um, and a lot of the, the writing that I do, um, I mean, I do a lot of writing in the morning when I'm prepping newscasts, but primarily the writing that I'm doing is feature writing. And the work that I do on features it always starts with a pitch. So it's a pitch to an editor. Um, it's a it's a pitch to the Midwest bureau chief at NPR or 
I recently did a story on the state's Medicaid system. That was a pitch to the, the science desk, the health desk at NPR in Washington. Um, so it starts with a pitch. So you're basically trying to sell an editor on the story. And a lot of the reporting I happen to do is national. So why should the rest of the country care about something that's going on in Iowa? And so it takes a lot of kind of careful crafting and honing <clears throat> of a pitch. And uh, then when the, the pitch is accepted, then you have to start thinking about, you know, who are the characters in the story? What is, you know, you've done your work to say, you know, this is what the story is going to be and this is why you care. And so then it's a, it's a matter of uh, going to the interview and trying to find that soundbite from that source or two uh, that's going to best tell the story. For feature writing, uh, I had a photojournalism professor. Yeah, photojournalism. I use it for, for audio reporting. But I had a photojournalism professor that said, when you're taking a photo, you need to look for action, reaction, and emotion. And I feel like the same thing is said for a compelling uh, public radio story. Uh, a couple examples come to mind. Uh, I, when this summer, I looked into some of the increase in ICE uh, pickups, arrests that have been happening in the Midwest. Um, and I found, through working through sources, I found a, a teenager whose father was picked up on the way to work. Uh, um, by working sources, I was able to go to their home and sit with the 15-year-old and, and hear her tell the story of how her dad was picked up by Immigration Customs Enforcement. Uh, and that was an opportunity to tell this girl's story. And I mean, the, the sound bites in that situation, uh, that really tells the story more so than anybody that's sitting behind a desk with my microphone that's, that's going to say. Um, another example is I, the story I recently did on uh, the state's Medicaid privatization. I went to the homes or to the home of one of the plaintiffs that was suing the governor and the DHS director. And uh, this man was in a bicycle accident, a hit and run. He was left paralyzed uh, about, he, he basically trapped in his own body, but he can't do anything on his own. Uh, the, the lawsuit alleges that he was in in-home care and was uh, uh, mistreated, um, and he lives with his girlfriend. And, I mean, that's just being trapped in hell. And he can't communicate. His girlfriend uh, did most of the speaking, all of the speaking, really. And there was a moment where she was bringing up the lawsuit, uh, and he didn't, it took a while for him to kind of gain trust in what I was uh, there to get from him. But when she brought up the lawsuit, he started to make a noise and through his uh, grunting was able to say, oh yeah, like he, it, was, it was happiness. And so that was an example of, you know, emotion, a, a reaction to something happening. And for me, in the kind of storytelling I try to do, that says a lot more when you can show uh, the pain or show the excitement in something that's happening in someone's life. Um, so th those kinds of sound bites are the more fun sound bites to find. Uh, otherwise, the sound bites you're trying to find for news stories. I mean, if you're if you're covering for for what we call spot news, what's in newscast, it's breaking news. I mean, you're really just looking for the meat. You know, the the what makes it news. Um, I know that you know when we. We'll regularly listen to Ben's show during the noon hour, and if he has a, a prominent newsmaker, we're listening to hear, you know, what is the, 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 the piece there that moves this story forward. And so you, you just kind of have to have radar on for those kinds of day of uh, sound bites. And then a lot of times, too, when bouncing back to feature writing, if, if a uh, newsmaker says something uh, that helps you better understand what you thought that you already knew. I mean, that's kind of a, a helpful way to kind of take it in a different direction. Or sometimes you're just, you know, trying to get them to say what you want them to say, which I guess is never the, the best way to do it. But sometimes you just have a deadline you've got. To right, make. right. And, 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 and you know, uh, some people are, are very wary, and I'm sure you've encountered this number, number of times, wary of journalists. Um, it would take, you know, one one person's bad experience to be misquoted in a local paper, and that sticks with you for a long time. Do you encounter uh, that lack of trust or even a suspicion that about your motives ever? Yeah, I mean, you get it a lot uh, during the, 
I mean, during the last campaign cycle, I got it a lot from uh, Donald Trump rallies, um, people that were skeptical of your motive. And, you know, what I always say to people is, hey, I'm, I'm just trying to say what's going on. <laughs> you know, that's that's all you can really do. Right. And if they're not if they're not comfortable with talking to you, I mean, a lot of times I will say to people in events where I'm just try, trying to find people. I come up and just say, hey, I'm Clay Madden with Public Radio. I'm working on a story about uh, Donald Trump and his campaign for presidency. Do you have some time to, uh, that I could pick your brain or do you want to just k- tell me to keep walking? And, you know, they chuckle in it because you're kind of being an Iowan as you talk to them <laughs> and approach them. They, they might be more willing to talk with you. Um, so it's just, you know, showing them that you're you're just like them. You're just trying to figure out what's going on right here. Mm-hmm. So there there is a little hesitance sometimes, but... Clay, we've got a few minutes left. I'm going to turn back to the, the class here. And raise your hand if you've got a question for Clay so I can come out, so, just so I get an idea of how many people there are. We've got one question back there. Okay, let me, I'm going to go back to the class. You may not see me, Clay, or see me okay. very small, but you'll hear, the class, you, you'll hear the question. We're still, we're still with you. All right. uh, this is Cindy in the back of the class, Cindy Brown. Hi, Cindy. I was wondering um, what... Uh, national TV journalists you trust and what uh, uh, news stations, cable news stations you trust? Okay. Um, You know, I I have to think about that because I spend more of my time uh, listening to NPR and reading uh, the New York Times and the Washington Post, but um, I I am really torn on uh, cable news. I don't have cable uh, I don't spend very much time watching cable. Um, you know, I, I think it's a it's helpful during presidential cycles to to watch uh, interviews that different candidates are making. But I, I feel like there's so much noise in commercial television, and a lot of that is because they're just trying to fill time. Uh, that I, I don't. I, I don't get a lot out of it. I think of uh, Jeff Zeleny is a reporter uh, with CNN who was originally at the, he actually is from Nebraska, which is where I'm from. And then he was at the Des Moines Register and then he was at the New York Times. And now he's with CNN. Jeff is a, is a reporter who I follow and pay attention to. Um, and, you know, I, I'll watch some of the talking heads on the Sunday morning shows that I can get on my DTV antenna. Um, so I'll, you know, there are times where I think Chris Wallace does good interviews on Fox News Sunday. Um, there are times that I, uh, I, I really like. Um, I can't think of his name now. That tells you how much I like him. But the the guy who does the, does ABC. Who, who am I thinking of? Somebody knows that. No. D- David Muir. <laughs> I can't think of his name. I'll, I'll email you who they, who they are. <laughs> Adjust your screen a little bit. We've got a bright light coming into here, too. Look at your, your control Uh-oh. picture. Don't, don't go towards it. Yeah, a little bit. We're kind of losing. You know, unlike a lot of us at radio, uh, Clay, you're a handsome guy, so we want to be able to see you. <laughs> 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 We've got another question. Please say your name and your question for, for Clay. My name is Galen, and my question is not serious, but I do listen to you in the morning. And I realized a while back at 10 to 9 that you are a happy guy. <laughs> By your voice, I'm thinking, oh, he's done. <laughs> Am I wrong? I just, I just was realizing then... <laughs> That you're not on again, and, no, and there was a no, little there's, happiness. There's <laughs> Comment on that? Or? No, there's, there's definitely some, some pep in my step on that uh, 849 break. <laughs> you're like, ooh, yeah. the shift is almost over. Well, actually, Clay, the shift yeah. is not over because that's when you do your work on your features is once you, yep, you know, you're done true. with morning but edition. I'm not shackled to the studio. Okay. And we do have real shackles. Um, yeah. Right. Clay has a whole variety of different colored shackles uh, that he gets shackled to the studio with. And they're quite decorative. You should show those sometime. They'll be in the Smithsonian someday. Yeah, I should. Hi, uh, my name is Sherry. I just wanted to ask, you had mentioned trusted journalists. 
Can you tell me what papers and what journalists you consider trustworthy? Is, you know, fake yeah. news or news? Uh, so uh, trusted journalists that I have, uh, that I pay attention to, um, a lot of local journalists I like that write for, uh, I, I, James Lynch at the Cedar Rapids Gazette a really good reporter. Uh, he's their political reporter. Uh, I also really trust uh, the writing that Jason Noble does at the Des Moines Register. And um, on commercial television side, Dave Price, who's at WHO in, in Des Moines, does a really nice job as well. He has a kind of a, a political show at night. Commercial television locally doesn't do enough of that. Um, and then as far as national reporters go, I have a lot of respect for uh, Tamara Keith, the White House correspondent for NPR. Um, I think she does a really good job of just just basically getting what's going on at the, the White House, which is pretty you know nonstop these days, uh, into concise stories. Uh, Don Gagne and Mara Liason, who are institutions at NPR, the national political correspondents there, I, I love their work. Uh, I, have, I have actually a friend of mine from college who's uh, working at the Washington Post for uh, covering the White House, Jenna Johnson. Uh, I really respect her reporting as well. Mm -hmm. With, we should mention, too, uh, I mean, I know we both respect the work of your predecessor, Sarah McCammon. Uh, Correct. Yep. Yeah. Former Morning Edition host who is now uh, out uh, east and did a lot of work in the 2016 campaign, actually was uh, covering the Trump campaign. Uh, a good deal uh, of the time uh, there, right. too. Uh, you know, I know you're not an analyst, but this, this is, I'd love to get your perspective. I think our class would love your perspective on this. We saw something different happen in the 2016 campaign in the way that the, the Trump campaign, Donald Trump, handled the media. Uh, there was not the traditional sort of, uh, uh, I'm asking you for an interview, and, you know, their campaign would accept that's why also why I brought up the instance where you, you know, it looked close, you looked close to having an interview with Donald Trump, but he, you know, some accused the media of being played by Donald Trump because he would, what, call into shows, he would not, except on Fox, he would not agree beforehand to be interviewed, right? So this changes the dynamic and gives a candidate perhaps an upper hand here, right? Yeah, um, and that was the thing, too, is I covered probably a dozen or so of the Donald Trump rallies. And the thing that I always, people would, always, you know, you'd interview people afterwards and they would say, oh, he shoots from the hip, that's why I like him. Oh, he just says whatever's on its mind. But if you went to enough of his uh, political rallies, he was really kind of saying the same thing over and over again. It was just kind of a choose-your-own-adventure Donald Trump book. And then there would be one instance uh, where he would say something that, and you'd kind of feel it on the way, the way that the press was reacting of the people around you. Uh, he would say one thing, and it would just dominate the next 24-hour news cycle. And so he didn't, he didn't need to do the traditional kind of uh, campaigning that you do in Iowa. I mean, he would parachute in, have a rally, people would show up, uh, whereas, you know, I, I couldn't get Bobby Jendel's people to stop calling me. <laughs> so, I mean, it was ju it was just a matter of he didn't feel the need to uh, to, to play it differently, and, and you know he didn't win the caucuses, but he carried yeah. Iowa pretty well in the in the yeah. in the general. Yeah, there, there were you will actually be um, you know there will be campaigns that will call you. I had a, a similar experience with Rand Paul. He was on River to River once, and. Uh, he, by, by any objective measure, did not come off well. He sounded, mm -hmm. he sounded grumpy. Maybe he was having a bad day. We all have bad days. But we got a, a call from the campaign. I think hours after that aired, they must have realized the same thing, and they offered us up Rand Paul again hmm. and said, well, we're going through all the candidates. We've had you, so uh, thank you. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, and that was too, I was re remembering as I was kind of getting ready to do this interview with you guys, uh, the, I did an interview with Hillary Clinton, and that was an uh, interview that I worked on sourcing for a, a really long time, um, because she had people here for a really long time. But 
we did an interview with her, and then you did an interview with Sanders, and then as we were getting closer to the caucuses, uh, I interviewed her again for something. I don't even remember what it was about, but they asked us if we wanted Hillary Clinton again after that final debate. But Sanders, people, you know, we'd had him on our air once, and it, it just, we didn't have a compelling reason enough to have her on the air again. Right. And so we, it was too close to the caucuses, and we didn't want to show any kind of favoritism. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, very different, uh, very different strategies, at least during the caucuses uh, and really during the general election from the two uh, ultimate nominees from their parties. Mm -hmm. So, Clay, we've, we've taken a lot of your time. I, I wanted to finish up here. Thank you for, uh, I have one final question. Thank you for, for taking the, the time to be with us from your home in, in Des Moines. Um, one last question. This is kind of not in the realm of interviewing, but there's a rumor that there's one hospital in Lincoln, Nebraska, uh, where two Iowa Public Radio employees were born. Yeah. Have you heard about this? Yeah, it's uh, Brian Memorial Hospital in Lincoln, Nebraska. It's where Ben Kiefer and Clay Masters were born. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> I'm sorry that he said so the joke around the offices is that everybody has heard that so many times that they just get angry when they hear us bring it up. So. Yeah, but we, we are so. not, we're not going to stop. We are no, not going to stop. Not, not at all. And, and you'll, you'll see in my message, we can see it on the screen here, uh, BMB. This is the this is the acronym. Oh, nice. Yeah. We're Bry. It's shortened. Bry Memorial Hospital. We're Bry Mem Bros. Yep. Yeah. So I'm how about a, fi a fist shake. bump to end this conversation? Yeah. There we go. Bry Mem Bro. <laughs> All right. <laughs> thanks for your time, Clay. Talk to you later. Uh, thanks. Good okay. Let's you. let's hear it for Clay Masters. <laughs> I'm going to go back to the fishing lodge. Go back to the fishing lodge. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Okay. What uh, Do I hit escape to go back to the chrome? What do I hit? Command Q, of course. That's self-evident. Command Q. Hey, it worked. Cool. Okay, that was fun. Clay's a great Clay. Clay's a great guy, as you gathered there, if you didn't know it beforehand. What a great guy, and we are so fortunate to have him as part of our, our landscape here in Iowa. Let's take a break. We've been at it over an hour, so uh, let's take a break till quarter till, and then our final minutes together. I'd like to have those who want to share about your own interviews about uh, of the someone with a pivotal experience and. Maybe we'll hear from James Brown. I hope we do. I think we will. We'll have time. We've got to have time for James Brown, right? All right. So let's take a break for about 10 minutes. And quarter till, we'll be back. So we got kind of cut off by Clay there talking uh, about it, but it was uh, nice uh, to, to talk with Clay. The, um, the, the, the last point, I think, that I had a, you know, an important point to bring from the Ira Glass interview is what he does so well is understands narrative and story. And interviews have this narrative and story, and I often follow it. Uh, and you will identify it in interviews that I do and that other people do. And it's very simple. It's what happened. What happened? Um, and that may be many steps to explain what happened. And then you reflect. Well, what do you think about what happened? It's pretty simple. What happened? What do you think about what happened? So if you want to interview someone about an experience in their life, that's an easy thing to remember. Um, my journalism students are always, you know, of course, you're in your 20s, want a, a very quick way, low effort way to remember how to interview anybody, the cookie, cookie cutter. And, and that would be, I think I've mentioned this, Gossy, G-O-S-S-E-Y. You can... You know, whether you're interviewing an author, a politician, uh, somebody who is interested in water quality, someone who wants to make more bike paths, uh, somebody who's worried about uh, air pollution, whatever the thing, you can always apply Gossie, which is, what is your goal? Have you explained your goal? 
What are the obstacles standing between you and what you want to change, your goal? How did your interest in this particular thing start, right? The second S is what is your solution to the problem we have here? The E before the last letter is evaluate. So you've been doing this for three years, for four months. How do you think it's been going? And finally, the why. Why are you doing this? What is motivating you to do this? That is the sure way, because I, I mean, I've been, you know, as much as I like to have a 15-week course and get into the real depth of, of interviewing, let's face it, if you're 20 and you want a job as a journalist, you want to know when a, a situation is thrown on me and your editor says, uh, oh, this person's available. You've got to go interview him right now. I said, well, I got, I got to go right now. What? What? What do I do? Right? <laughs> Gossy is, is one way you, you can uh, wrangle an interview out of that and actually have it turn out pretty well. Let's talk. Okay. Let's talk about your experiences. And I have this paper here. I was handed another one here, too. And Let's get as much of your experience here because this is where I hope you took the, remember I gave you a license, right? It expired or is expiring unless you make something up and tell someone that you're still taking this class. It actually was extended. Um, the license to talk to someone about a pivotal experience and um, Mary, Mary Wallace Gutman. No. There you are. Uh, you know, Mary handed me this last week. And you interviewed three people. I had some excerpts here, or did you, do you mind if I read some excerpts from this? This was really interesting. Mary really took advantage of this and, ho ho hold on, L let me get to you with a microphone. Okay, the last paragraph describes the people. Right, and I was gonna include this. So this is not everything that Mary had, but, but just some astounding quotes here that she sort of, pulled from these people, very simple, but very moving. So uh, Mary um, got in touch with three women, and she identifies them as the, by their first names, only here. And so um, Kate, the question to all of them is, what was the most, what it was a pitiful moment in your life? This is Kate. When my mother committed suicide, she had a psychiatric illness. She stepped in front of a train. She was determined to do it. I had caught her and stopped her a time before. I wasn't there when she finally did it. Uh, a, a little, you know, a little bit later in the interview, same person, Kate, talking about her mother. My grandfather brought me a piece of torn fabric to ID. There was even a bit of fat sticking to it. I knew that the material was from her dress. I knew it was she. There was a closed casket. I had a lifetime of magical thinking because of it. Never sure. Was it real? Would she come back? It was the first time I saw my dad cry. I kept going, but it was years before I could say the words, my mother. I have a hard time saying that, reading it. You know you're reading powerful work when you get the hairs on the back of your neck raised and you have to compose yourself. It happens to me occasionally on the radio, but I don't know if it affects you that way too. A couple of other passages from Mary's excellent work here. This is Marilyn, another. She took. She took her license and really went to, t you just wrote down, and, and did, you, did you do any editing to that? It was so simple and so powerful. No, 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 no. they're very intelligent women. No, I, I did. they are, they are. This is Mar Marilyn, pivotal moment, number two from Marilyn. I had two older brothers and one younger. When the little one was four, he was hit by a semi and killed. We were going for a walk, and Teddy begged to come along. The highway crossed a bridge. He ran across, 
then got scared and ran back to me for safety and was hit. We lived in a rural area. Mom and I never talked about it. And that's when I stayed, started to have nightmares. Teddy and I would have been close. I never was with my older brothers. Wow. Deep breath, right? Finally, Anne here. Anne's account of her most pivotal experience. My grandmother died when I was nine. My mother was an only child. When Nanny died, mother took it badly. She had a complete nervous breakdown, spent eight or nine months in the hospital. I didn't recognize her as the same person when she came out. She used to tell stories and put on little plays with me. Now, she'd sit in the living room and suddenly start screaming for no reason. She was given addictive meds. Her behavior got more and more erratic. It wore, my, wore down my father. We kids tried to take care of her, but we never knew what she'd do. She picked on the oldest daughter, who got married. My older brother went into the monastery. The next one got into trouble, but then went into college. I was the middle child, got very depressed. Mother put me in the hospital, saying, you'll have to graduate from high school, or you'll stay in the mental hospital. Dad visited me every Wednesday. Mom never came. Now, with these stories, and, and they're all around us, and this is why I also love the work of, of people like Studs Terkel and uh, Ira Glass. Uh, you know, generation, a generation or two ago, more than that, but, I mean, prior to Studs Terkel, for instance, the only people deemed worthy to interview were, you know, big shots politicians, leaders, and things like that. And, you know, thank goodness we realize everybody has a story to tell, and there's some really amazing moments. Uh, Mary captured them here through the happy note that, that, that Mary put at the end. I'm so glad you put this because uh, this is what she writes about all three women. All three women are steady, love to talk, and enjoy a joke. They are skilled in what used to be called the household arts, cooking, sewing, and allied crafts, as well as having been clearly effective in their work before they retired. They led intellectually stimulating and positive lives, and the dramatic, even tragic events appear to have washed over them without coloring their outlooks in negative ways. Thanks for the great work there, Mary. That was really awesome. I want some other people to share whatever you would like to share about your experience, um, what you learned, what surprised you, maybe a quote that you will not forget, what it felt like, were you a little bit on edge before you did this? I know I put the, the, the a main act right there in the beginning. It's like, how do you match that? <laughs> Probably shouldn't have done that. That's, that's, that's a mean thing to do, isn't it? Okay. Thanks, Phyllis. So I uh, interviewed a person named Judy. Uh, and Judy used to work at Memorial Sloan Kettering, um, having uh, majored in biochemistry. So she worked in the lab for a cancer hospital. And then in midlife, she went to seminary and became a Lutheran minister. So I interviewed Judy and said, well, what was a pivotal moment in your life? Um, so Judy answered, it was the fall. I, I remember being in nature, probably in, enjoying the colors. And um, a sense came to me that I really wanted to uh, be the best that God had made me for. I wanted to do the best, be the best, um, and do something for others. Um, in a way that was different from my present career. Most people would say, why would you want to change your job? You have a job. I, she said, I had a middle class mentality where friends would say, you've got a job. You have a living. Why would you change? Uh, but she had that prompting that was pivotal in her life. Um, then she said, and then I got validation. At the time, she was in New York and attended St. Peter's 
uh, that had a well known for their jazz um, uh, services, and there was a businessman who had been a pastor, but uh, minister to that congregation. So here's a pastor who knew her. Uh, and when she had come to that revelation, um, Pastor Steve's words to her were, were um, Judy, I think God must have kicked your ass black and blue before you answered that call. <laughs> There, there's your quote. <laughs> Perhaps a little unchristian in, in its wording, but gets the point across. Who else? Anybody else like to share about their experience? Okay, let's go. Yeah. And you will succeed. Not only try. So, hard X to follow. Um, I interviewed my sister-in-law. Um, she's 16 years older than I am. Uh, when, when I met her, she had just married my brother. She was 23, and I was seven. I had a, a purpose for this that was kind of complicated. I knew that she was having dementia problems, but I haven't seen her in three years until I saw her a couple of weeks ago. Uh, she was diagnosed with Alzheimer's two years ago. And she remembers things from a long time ago, typically better than today. She, she's at that awkward position that she doesn't remember and she knows she doesn't remember. And she gets very upset. I wanted to know for her pivotal moment, how she felt when she met me. I thought she was the most beautiful girl in the world. And as I think back, she was 23 years old, had already married my brother, and met her par parents-in-law, her much younger sister-in-law, and all the other relatives at once. And I, th I thought, how could my parents have done that, you know, now? But I, wa I wanted to know about that pivotal moment. We were sitting in... Atlanta on my niece's porch. It was absolutely gorgeous. And I had taken a dozen pictures of my children and my grandchildren. And had to set this up, I carefully went through the pictures and explained who the people were, trying to be positive. And to go from one picture to the next, she wouldn't remember that the person in picture number two was my oldest son, whose picture she had just seen, and she wanted to know each time if she had ever met him. And, and the person in picture two looked nothing like the person in picture one. So that, that kind of sets it up. Uh, I said, well, you know, I'd, I'd like to talk about when you met mom and dad and me, and I gave all the prompts, I told the story, but I wanted to know how did she feel about meeting me. And I really struggled to ask the questions in positive ways to make her feel good and not to feel badly about herself for forgetting. And I kept drilling down and finally, I, I set it up, uh, well, uh, it's been a long time ago. Uh, we met you in Denver, and Mom and Dad were there, and, and all of that. And I, I just wondered how it made you feel to meet your in-laws when you would just gotten married. She looked at me and said, well, it was hard. My in-laws didn't have to like me worth a damn. And then I asked her the, the real question, and I was scared. I said, well, how did you feel meeting me? She said, oh, you were just a kid. I could play with you. You just fit right into a slot. And I didn't know, I haven't been able to write this down. I just couldn't do it, and it's hard to talk about, but I promised myself I would. 
Um, just that we could share that special pivotal moment in both of our lives, despite her current physical condition. So thank you for listening to me. It means a lot. Carolyn, thank you. That was wonderful. That was really good. Very satisfying to hear. Anybody with an experience they're burning to share? Are we? Here's the good news. You've been such a good class, your licenses are not revoked. <laughs> so you can interview, continue to interview people about their pivotal experiences, life experiences. And they say, well, I thought that class was last month or last year. Well, it's part of continuing education. And, Bi and Ben says you have to keep this up because, you know, once you're on that path, it's kind of dangerous to go, you know, you can, anyway, okay, you get the idea. Uh, let's see, two more things here before we adjourn. And um, I promised uh, we can spend a few minutes. I don't know if there are any questions. It's okay if there aren't any questions. Ask me anything, AMA, AMA. Anything about interviewing? Or have we exhausted the topic? We know everything about it. Yeah. Yeah. I'll, I'll do my best. I'm not the, 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 la the final source for everything interviewing. I can give you my take on whatever you ask. Okay, you are Anne. Do you have any surefire methods it, um, to use when you know that the interview is not going well? <laughs> oh, that's uh, trying to recall. When an interview is not going well, I can, rec <laughs> yeah, uh, I learned uh, one, one story that you remind me of is, is uh, early on, this was quite a while ago, um, before even I had my daily show, which I've had since 2007, I was, as I recall, the news peg was uh, dark energy, dark matter. Don't ask me the difference. But you remember a few years ago, we had discovered dark energy, dark, 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 dark matter. Okay, this, I, and so I, I said, okay, we've got to have an a, a astrophysicist in to explain this. It's very complicated, so we wanted to do it. So, and this was a time when, I, when we didn't even have a producer. I was producing my own shows, so I would get a topic. And uh, some of the, thank goodness, we have we have producers now because they, as Emily described, you know, can say, okay, what kind of person do you have there? Do they, if they're an astrophysicist, do they talk up here and everybody rolls their eyes, or do they make it accessible to you? This was before any of that. So I got on the phone. I said, oh, I'd like to interview you about this dark energy. Let's just say it's dark energy. And, and he said, okay, okay, good. That's good. And we on live and when, when to show up. And then I get this call back. I said, oh, so what are you going to ask me? Okay. So I spent a half an hour with this astrophysicist. And he kept, he was just picking my brain, like, oh, okay, I'm gonna, I'm, 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 well, I wanna say, well, how does dark energy, dark matter fit into the, the, the story of the beginning of the universe? And, oh, okay, I know something about, does that have something to do with the Big Bang? Oh, yes, yes, okay. And so he, he just, bah, bah, bam, bam, hit me with questions. And I was answering my things. And, and, and he said, what else are you gonna ask? So he kept saying, what else are you gonna ask? And I said, well, I was just, you know, brainstorming questions and cut off the phone with him. And, and I said, we'll see you tomorrow, I'll see you tomorrow. So he comes to uh, the interview, sits down in the studio. I didn't notice he had a big legal tablet with him. I should have noticed that. I always watch for legal tablets now, because you know what's coming, right? So live, we're live. And I asked, uh, you know, and I, I had, for, you know, not forgotten. I knew where I was going in this interview, but I didn't have exact questions in my mind. So I started asking the, the first question about this, and he's like, just glued to my face. And I asked the first question and he goes, looks down his, and he starts flipping through his legal pad. So that's what you hear on the radio. No, back a few pages. No, it was there. Okay, yeah, no, that must be this question. And then the crowning achievement, you get him trying to read his own writing. <laughs> when he finds the answer. <laughs> it's not an answer to your question, but I love telling that story. 
And now my response is, you know, and, and if, you, if you've ever been interviewed by a producer, because you'll often get, what are the questions? Because people, and understandably so, are very unsure about being interviewed. I want to know the exact question. I want control of this situation. The way I get control of this situation is to know every darn question that Ben Kiefer is going to ask me. That doesn't make good radio. It makes really crappy radio. <laughs> and so, and so the, the question is, you know, if we turn to you and you talk to a producer about it, and you've got a green light to come on the show, you've got to have confidence and trust in us that you know your material, you're an expert in your area, uh, uh, that, that, that you're on, have confidence that we know you can explain and tell this story or, or, or whatever you're going to tell, something like that. But anyway, so go ahead. Well, I was going to ask you your worst interview, but I may know it already. Uh, who is your favorite interview? Favorite interview? I, uh, a favorite um, interview situation. You know, we're supposed to be non-political, but I'll just share this. We'll see if it gets on the, the web. In 2009, um, we had a Supreme Court ruling here in Iowa, right? Very surprising. In fact, we didn't have this show planned on it because we thought we knew the U.S. Supreme Court was going to decide that way. I, and I shared with you at the beginning of the class, you know, how I experienced history in, in Germany, being fortunate enough to scramble to Berlin for the fall of the wall. It's... My favorite interviews are when you hear history happen at the moment. That conversation is so easy, and you know people are listening, and it matters, like the Berlin Wall falling and interviewing Berliners, the East German couple who came to the wall, leaving East Berlin, you know, not knowing if this, this was the opening in the wall, not knowing what would happen We'd stood all night and watched this wall go down in this section. And this East Berlin couple comes to experience that freedom. The wall standing since 1961, a wall which people had tried to dig under, tried to fly over to escape. And now uh, they're here, um, man and wife, the man and wife having a... a a bicycle and being told you can go across and across the way over there are the West Berliners by the hundreds, the Dutch, somehow they got truckloads of flowers, tulips, of course. And um, it's hard to tell without getting emotional about it. But watching the stoic man, the woman was visibly shaken, worried, wore it on her face in her expression. The man, up to a point, was completely stoic. And then he took that first step. He lost it. 2009 was a little bit like that, when that court ruling came across for people who have somebody who um, uh, is a gay or lesbian and wanted to marry. Some of that was, was, was happening there to sense, to sense history in the making would be my answer to a favorite moment. Okay, Rich. Let me get that on microphone or Eric will be upset. Who is one person that you haven't interviewed that you would like to? Uh, uh. <laughs> um, it wouldn't be a politician, I don't think. I'm often frustrated by politicians. <laughs> Had enough of them. Unless they'll agree to be just a real person with me <laughs> and not have the public figure in front of me. I think I would like to interview Studs Terkel. Um, 
It would be a challenge. I revere him. And I did have a chance to interview him at the end of his life, very close. At the end of his life, he came out with a final book. I don't even remember what it was. But then WBEZ, and he's based in Chicago, and I'd heard that he was available for interviews. I'm like, oh, my God, this is, this is a man I've revered for so many years. And I knew a lot of his stories that he told about the years he's spent doing uh, radio interviews in Chicago. And um, so we set this up, and I went into the studio. They, some, someone close to him should have said, you know, that time is not here anymore. Uh, what We didn't end up using the interview. It was recorded. I think I just got rid of it. I didn't want to hear it anymore. And, uh, you know, he was at the end of his life. There were bits and pieces of stories that I recognized that I'd heard three or four times. Uh, but it was not, not anything you would want to, to broadcast or should broadcast, as you can understand. So let's say Studs Terkel in his prime. One last, because I want to, want, we're getting close to James Brown time. So, oh, boy, we got to get James in there. I, I understand you're not real fond of political figures interviewing, but I don't remember you interviewing Barack Obama. I would just wanted you to tell a little bit about that. Well, well, very quickly, uh, my colleague Jeff Schmidt uh, interviewed Barack Obama. Jeff has since moved on. He lives in the Chicago area. He's turned into a producer, then ex executive producer. What happens when we have a political field, and, and Clay is part of this too, is there are four or five of us, me, Pat Blank, Clay, um, a few others, who, uh, you know, we have a political season, and you don't know. You have 16 candidates in the GOP ranks alone, uh, depending on what year it is. Maybe it's open on both sides. So we divide up. And also, you know, we have egos. We want to, we would love to have all the interviews, right? But we don't. So beforehand, we get together and we kind of divvy up names. Uh, I didn't get Barack Obama. <laughs> I got Hillary Clinton. Um, uh, but not Barack Obama. Let's listen to this as, as a way to kind of go to uh, an ending here that's not an interview I did. I like to trot this out, though, because it's what can happen in a live interview. This is an ad. This is what can happen. And this is like from the 1980s. Uh, Sonia, does that program ring a bell with anybody? Some morning show. But uh, I've interviewed the bi a biographer of James Brown, but never James Brown, and a big fan of his. But just watch. This is what happens when somebody's under the influence of substances, <laughs> and they get interviewed on live radio. Okay. It resulted, as a matter of fact, in Brown assaulting his wife with a lead pipe and firing a gun at a car that she was in. These are charges that Brown denies. He was released yesterday on $15,000 bond. He joins us for, from Atlanta to discuss the charges, and we welcome you, James Brown. How did all of this trouble begin? Living in America. <laughs> something wrong. Nothing wrong at all. You're not in any difficulty, but you're out on bond. No, I'm not. Have I'm all not. the charges been dropped? Yeah, I'm out on love. Oh, well, are you out on love or out of love? Which yeah, is it? Out on love. Alone from night to night, you find me. Now, James, this isn't the first time you and your wife have had a problem. Are the two of you going to be able to work this out? Let's talk about some music. You oh. want to talk about music, and you don't want to talk about what happened. No, it's all over. Well, let's talk about your tour. When are you leaving? We're leaving tomorrow. And where are you going? Uh, Rio, de, Rio de Janeiro and Sao Paulo, Brazil. Now, your, your fans will have read all about this, James. Aren't you concerned about no, that? No, you're the Caramuche. No, Dagestan. I'm, I'm, I'm concerned because there's nothing wrong. And what are you going to say to your fans when they ask you some questions about it? I'm going to say I feel good. Papa's got a brand new bag. It's a man's world. Well, that's the second time we've heard that in two days. That's very interesting. Now, don't leave us, James. You stay right there. I'm we have more that we have something. to talk about. Well, tell us a little bit about what you're going to be Hello, doing Dad. on this tour. Huh? What'd you say? What are you going to be doing on this tour? I'm going to be doing Papa's got a brand new bag, living in America, sex machine, get up off of that thing. I feel good. Jam.
Now, I understand that you I'm have real. already... James, I have to ask you one serious question here. I understand you already have started divorce proceedings. Does that mean that you're now eligible? Oh, uh, no. I'm, yes, I'm eligible. I'm saying it. Uh, I want to mingle. You want to mingle? Yeah. Now, the women love you when you get out there. Why do you think that is? What did you say? The women love you when you get out there. Why is that, ladies? Well, I'm asking you. Huh? Because I look good. Why do you think good. that is? You I look smell good. good. I yes. feel good. And you sing good. And make love good. Oh. Well, there we are. We don't have to ask anybody else. We got that from the source. <laughs> there, there you are. <laughs> now, you're involved in publishing a gospel magazine. Tell us a little bit about that. The Second Coming. It's, uh, it's out of Augusta, Georgia, the anchor. Joseph P. Young is the editor, and James Brown is one of the advisors. And we're doing a fantastic job. The Second Coming. It features, uh, on this week, I think we have the Pope and, um, I believe, the, the, Williams, the Williams brothers. Mm -hmm. And last, uh, next week we're going to have Reverend Al Sharpton, I think, on the cover. Mm -hmm. And uh, we'll be doing a lot, a, lot, a lot of good things, and hopefully we'll get Brother Ted Turner on the cover. Ted, well, where you at? James, we want to thank you for having, for being with us today Wait and a giving minute, us I an opportunity. Oh, is there something more you want to say that we yeah, haven't covered? Yeah, I want to say a lot of things. Okay, I go love ahead. You. I love America. I love everybody. Well, I feel good. It sounds to me as though you're not troubled by any of this at all. This is a man's world. Thanks for reminding us of that. Every once in a while, we forget. Get up on We remember it again. James, good luck on your tour. Thanks for being with us. I guess we're going to hear lots more. Hasta luego. <laughs> okay. Okay. Well. Given what, what happened there, complete surprise, that Sonia did a pretty good job. <laughs> she kept going. She kept going. She had a live situation there with a big star. Uh, well, thank you very much for, for the past uh, uh, four sessions here. And uh, as I, I said to my wife, I said, oh, it's a Wednesday. It's a long day, work day, and then go teach class. And I said that. She goes, oh, long day. And I said, oh, like class is just pure, pure enjoyment. That's a lot of fun. And you have made it a lot of fun for me. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'll be around for a few minutes if you have any questions, anything like that. I hope to see uh, you in the future, uh, hear from you in the future, and I, and I hope you got a good uh, kick out of this class because I sure did. All right, thank you.